so hopefully you can see me I can't see your questions anymore but I will close the presentation at the end so I can answer all of those live when they come up so I'm going to talk about the nutritional management of EDS which is hopefully what you have come here for um hang on one second my name is Sophie Medlin. All of my social media handles are under Sophie Dietitian. If you want to follow me on other platforms or obviously on here, I have got a professional Facebook page as well. I've been a dietitian for a long time. For those of you that don't know, um, dietitians are like the medical nutrition people. So if you have a medical condition that you would normally see a doctor for, you need a dietitian rather than a nutritionist. Nutritionists are traditionally the healthy nutrition people. So if you have a, a you know, if you want to improve your already healthy self then see a nutritionist uh, but if you want to work on something that is a, is a medical problem you need to see a dietitian and uh, we're the only ones that do any medical training so we're the only ones that work in hospitals and various other places at the end I'll talk a little bit about why some of us don't know very much at all about EDS and how you can perhaps advocate for yourself so I think that's really important in these kinds of conditions um, I within my career worked in the NHS for uh, about seven or eight years, I think. Um, and I specialise in the management of complex colorectal disorders, so bowel disorders. Um, and of course, lots of my patients have uh, motility disorders, so including EDS, um, because obviously it affects our, our bowel motility and how we can function in that way. Um, I then went on to lecture, so I was a lecturer and researcher at Plymouth University and then most recently at King's College in London. Um, and about two years ago, I quit my job and started my business, which is called City Dietitians. And now we see, so I see patients one-on-one -on -one in my clinics, which are all over Zoom at the moment. And of course, you're all welcome to book into and come and see me. Um, I also work for companies. So I work in product development and work with um, all kinds of different companies doing all kinds of different things um, in the nutrition space. And I also do some work in the media. So today, for example, I haven't had any patients today, but I normally would. So yesterday I was in clinical day seeing patients over Zoom in my house now which is such a strange experience for me having had a whole career of people face to face uh, but today i've been on a farm all day filming for itv west country about uh, the uh, impending kind of changes to our agriculture bill which are all happening if you want to see me being licked by a cow you can look at that on my instagram page um, and then just after that i did i came home and went straight into a a uh, panel discussion at the end of a conference about product development and now obviously i'm very happy to be here talking to you um, about more clinical things and bowel things so it was so great to receive your feedback on what you would like to hear about that was really really helpful and i will confess that i can't fulfill all of your uh, desires so unfortunately we don't have time to cover both fatigue management and the bowel stuff the motility stuff so i'm just going to focus on the bowel things this evening we can certainly do another session on fatigue management another time i'd be very happy to come back and cover that for you in a different session so I'm going to talk about what the nutritional problems are that are caused by EDS, what management strategies we have available. Again, I'm going to talk a bit about self-advocacy. Um, as you will all probably be aware, there are very few medical professionals who have a keen interest and understanding of EDS, and that does have a massive impact on your ability to get help when you need it. But it's really important to me that you leave this session feeling empowered and able to get help and able to go to doctors wherever you need to go to and say, this is what I need and this is the help that I have. And here's where the doctor can go. So here's where you can go to get more information about that. So you understand that I'm, I'm telling the truth and this is what I need. Um, at the end, I've got your questions all gathered up um, and also your feedback from the survey, which was super helpful. And again, at the end, what I'll do is I'll close the presentation so I can see your questions on Facebook and we can scroll through those and find any other ones that come up. So please do interact in that way. That would be brilliant. So in terms of the gastrointestinal manifestations of EDS, when we talk about gastrointestinal, for those of you who have no medical education, which is probably most of you, gastrointestinal refers to both our upper GI tract, so from our mouth to the bottom of our stomach, and then everything from our small bowel all the way through to our colon and even the rectum, so the very last part of our bowel. I'm a bowel specialist dietitian, so I'm very happy and comfortable talking about poo and about bowels and about rectums, about colons. I appreciate that it might be a little bit odd for some of you, but I'm very comfortable with it. So um, if I'm a bit flippant about it, I apologize in advance. Um, the problem of course with connective tissue disorders and EDS isn't on its own in this category, but connective tissue disorders have an impact on all of the connective tissue in our bodies. So it's not just our joints, but also the connective tissue that helps move things through our gut. So we have rings of cartilage, we have bits of bowel that are held up by special webbing. We have um, very important muscles that help to move things through our gut. 
Um, and the structure of our gut is really held together by connective tissue in the same way the rest of our body is. And, and for that reason, EDS very much impacts our gastrointestinal tract and the ability our bowel has to move things through, to maintain its structure and integrity, and for us therefore to be able to absorb and enjoy food in, in, a, in a normal way, in a healthy way. Common problems with EDS include hernias, and that's because the structure of the abdominal wall isn't as sound as it might be in someone without EDS. And you can maybe see from this picture what's happening with a hernia. I think there's generally a sort of poor understanding about what hernias are and what happens. What happens is where there's any kind of gap or weakness in the abdominal wall, a small amount of small bowel, so a couple of loops of small bowel can poke through there. And what then happens, as you can see from this diagram, is that, that there's a narrowing, there's a tightening of the small bowel, which can sometimes stop food from moving through it properly or poo essentially from moving through it properly. So things can get a bit trapped. And that's when it can become a strangulated hernia and the blood supply can cut off. For a lot of people with hernias, what happens is intermittently through the day, the food gets a bit stuck. They get really, really bloated and uncomfortable and then suddenly it all rushes through and then things get a bit, well, and then maybe they need to rush to the loo and things like that. So that's a really common thing that happens for people with EDS. Hernias can occur anywhere in the body. So sometimes you might have heard of a hiatus hernia where a bit of a portion of your stomach height comes up above your diaphragm and that can cause a lot of problems with reflux and that sort of thing. You can get a hernia near your tummy button, so an umbilical hernia. Uh, lots of men get them further down in their groin, so femoral hernia we would call them. If you've ever had any bowel surgery, it's very common to have them around an inc incision, so an incisional hernia. But they really can happen anywhere on the body, particularly in patients with EDS. And a hernia, again, is just a protrusion of bowel through the abdominal wall. Another really common problem that I deal with a lot in my clinics is prolapses. Uh, and again, this is to do with the structure of the bowel just not being as integral as it normally would be so that it's just not very strong in the way that we'd like it to be and that can mean that passages like the rectum can prolapse down and come out of the bottom and as you can see from this diagram here that again creates this narrowing in the rectum that stops poo from being able to trans be cut, taken out of the body and into the toilet which causes all kinds of really uncomfortable problems and it may feel like it's constipation and you may be treated for constipation, but it may well be that there's either an internal or external prolapse, which is stopping and blocking the poo from being able to come out properly. There are lots of things in terms of dietary intervention we can do to make that better. Um, and it's really important that you get some help with that if you think that might be happening to you. Intersusception is a similar problem to a prolapse, but it's more like an internal prolapse. So what's happening in an intersusception? is that the bowel is sort of folded in on itself. And again, it's about the, the lack of integrity of the, of the muscles of the connective tissue that keeps the bowel in shape. So what's happening is when there's pressure, the bowel is folding in on itself, as you can see from this diagram. Um, and again, this causes this narrowing in the bowel. This diagram, this picture here, is showing intersusception of the small bowel into the colon. So this would occur on the right hand side of your abdomen low down if you were having this problem and you would feel it and experience it in different places and, and, and you would notice the symptoms being in different places depending on where this problem was in your gut. I've seen this in people's small bowels, in their jejunum, in their stomach, in lots of different parts of their bowel and it's, it's certainly not an uncommon problem particularly in conditions like EDS. The way that you would experience this in terms of symptoms is similar to the other conditions where, where the other problems we've talked about where food when we eat it if it's if there is an intersusception the bolus of food so the bits of food that are trying to travel through your bowel get stuck in that narrowing and can't go through and very often that will result in um, maybe some vomiting maybe a period of distension where your bowel or your tummy blows up like a balloon and then eventually it might release and let itself through and in extreme cases it might cause perforation and problems like that Again, there are dietary treatments we can use to try and prevent this from happening and certainly to help us to try and find out if it's happening and whereabouts in the gut it's happening so that we can try and support you to get some treatment. Motility, as you all will know, oh well, motility refers to the transport of food or, or poo through your bowel, from your mouth into your through to your bottom. And gastrointestinal motility is a problem for lots of people with EDS. And that, as you will probably know, and I'm sure you do know, causes delayed gastric emptying. So your, your stomach itself 
stays full for too long, doesn't empty, food can build up in there, that can cause vomiting, dis a lot of pain, discomfort, the food is sitting in the stomach for too long um, and that then inevitably leads to poor appetite and poor nutritional intake, um, which is a completely normal consequence of delayed gastric emptying. Constipation again is a really, really common problem and that's because when when poo enters the large bowel, so the colon in this picture, the larger bit that wraps around the edge of the bowel, and we need it to move the poo along like this with concentric movements, we call it peristalsis. And in EDS very commonly, that's not happening very effectively. And it's the same smooth muscle that's affected that would normally help your stomach to empty, is not helping your colon to empty, is not pushing things along your colon as we would like it to. Um, that can lead to a sort of constipation that's actually um, much, much more difficult to treat than other types of constipation, certainly not impossible, but is a challenge. And for some people, really laxatives uh, are not that helpful. And we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, constipation obviously leads to other things like headaches and lack of energy, um, lethargy, and that can all feed into the fatigue picture, which all becomes a big part of um, obviously classic EDS presentation. When we talk about functional symptoms, we talk about the, the things that you experience or the, the symptoms that you have as a result of the problems with your guts. Um, and these include things like swallowing problems, which we sometimes call dysphagia. Um, and I'm just using this diagram here just, I guess, to illustrate how many muscles are involved in swallowing and swallowing effectively and safely um, and why that's so difficult. So in order for us to swallow in a way that protects our airway and stops us from choking, we have to coordinate such a large number of very small muscles in our throat and in our larynx and we're expecting a valve to close at exactly the right moment to stop it from going into your airway. But sometimes for people with EDS, this can be more of a problem. And you may notice that you choke a bit more often than other people, that you find that you'll feel a bit gurgly when after you've eaten, maybe you have some phlegmy cough after you've eaten, or you might wake up having to do a lot of throat clearings that <coughs> all the time, which is a sign that maybe in the night you're aspirating a little bit of your saliva and things like that. So swallowing problems are common in EDS as is gastroesophageal reflux disease, so reflux. Um, and that's because, again, those smooth, smooth muscles that normally push things down the esophagus, so this part, don't work as effectively. And or the valve that stops things coming up from the stomach isn't working quite as effectively. And that allows acid to come up through the esophageal tract and into the mouth sometimes, creating this horrible reflux disorder. Dyspepsia refers to having too much stomach in your acid, uh, sorry, acid in your stomach. And um, that can cause things like stomach ulcers and these sorts of problems. That's generally related to delayed gastric emptying. Um, and there are medications we can use to, to manage that quite effectively. As many of you will be aware, EDS inevitably causes constipation with a lack of movement along the bowel, but it can very much also be linked to diarrhea. And that's partly because of maybe a lack of absorption of nutrients in the small bowel. So too much of stuff is being delivered into the, into the large bowel, or it can be that the large bowel is just very sluggish and not doing its job properly. Um, and so the poo comes through too quickly, um, creating these problems with diarrhea. And it's and unfortunately, again, relatively common. In terms of nutritional management, I've broken this down into first line, second line, and third line. And what I mean by that, and what we refer, what we mean by that, certainly within the NHS, is the sort of levels of management that we have. So first line management would be the first things we would do, all of these things we'd want to do before we considered escalating your care to second line management. In terms of first line management, one of the first things that I always recommend for my patients is that we get their doctor to prescribe them a medication called metoclopramide. Metoclopramide is a prokinetic medication, so it supports the movement of everything through the gut. It helps with those peristaltic movements. It's commonly used as an anti-sickness medication and it's effective for that, but the reason it's effective for that is because it makes your stomach empty. It doesn't just make your stomach empty, it makes the whole of your bowel move a little bit more effectively. So as a first line treatment in EDS, that can work really, really effectively for lots of people and can keep people away from more extensive and more um, invasive forms of nutritional therapy for quite a long time. Um, laxatives can also be used. Um, it's important to use a range of different laxatives for different reasons and for different types of constipation. So if you're suffering with lack of contractions of the bowel, what you would experience is just never really feeling like you need to go to the toilet unless suddenly you're very constipated and very uncomfortable. 
um, versus the sort of uh, laxatives we would use if somebody somebody's poo is coming but it's very dry and difficult to pass. So there's two different types of laxatives we would use and it's important that you use the right ones and the right ones in combination. Very often with my patients we'll talk about trying to use um, suppositories rather than using laxatives so putting lots of laxatives in the top end when they don't really go anywhere or aren't very effective can create pain and discomfort and challenges in that way if we can use suppositories um, so glycerin suppositories for example it's just lubricating the back passage and allowing any poo that is there to come through um, in a bit more of a natural way so we're not putting lots of medications in the top we're supporting things from the bottom up has less of a systemic effect and is generally a bit more effective for people um, and certainly um, that's something that I talk about quite a lot with my patients and it's maybe something we're less comfortable with in the UK than, than in other countries. Um, it's really helpful to try and understand the different types of fibre in our diet and how that impacts in, on our gut and similarly to the uh, laxative story there's two different types of fibre and they both act in different ways. Soluble fibre is most commonly found in things like the inside of an apple, it's in oats, it's the sort of softer fibre that creates more of a gel if you sort of soak it in anything. If you think about the stewed apples and how they stew down and that gel that's created when you do that, a similar thing is happening in the gut. So when we have soluble fibre it draws lots of water to the bowel and keeps the stool really soft. It also feeds the microbiome and gives lots of good um, extra nutrients to the bowel which is really really helpful. But if you just have soluble fiber, the bowel doesn't have anything to contract on to push the poo along. So even if those contractions aren't happening very often or very regularly, when they do happen, there might just be nothing there to help with that contraction. Insoluble fiber is things like skins and peels and pips and pulses. And that type of fiber is what gives our bowel something to contract on, can stimulate those contractions to push things along. So fibre manipulation in dysmotility disorders and in EDS is really, really helpful. With some of those conditions we were talking about earlier, like hernias and intersusception, we can't use insoluble fibre in those conditions. It's really important that you get some advice on managing and manipulating fibre before you try to cut things out or add things into your diet, because it can certainly make things better or worse. Um, but it is a really helpful way of trying to um, manage your symptoms. It's just a case of understanding it uh, and trying to make things a bit better. Nutritional adequacy means that the, new, the food that you are eating meets all of your nutritional requirements. And so often my patients um, come to me with all kinds of different disorders and problems, but they've cut out lots of foods from their diet to try and manage their symptoms, <coughs> excuse me, and have been left with a very, very limited diet, which doesn't meet their nutritional needs. And of course that leads to things like nutritional deficiencies, which lead to things like worse gut function, which lead to things like more fatigue. All of these problems in combination can be really, really traumatic and problematic for patients. Um, within our first line therapy, we would certainly also consider liquid supplements. And you may have seen these called things like Ensures, 40 Sips, Fresh Bin Energy. Those are AIM shakes also really common now. These kind of liquid nutritional supplement drinks uh, can be used as sip feeds and um, liquids generally empty much more effectively from the stomach than the solids so we can get some really good nutrition into people through those with a little bit of eating where it's comfortable and where it's possible and um, before we have to consider any kind of second line treatment. Second line treatment being the next level up um, would be things like surgical intervention so um, if you have really terrible problems with co colonic motility, so where poo is just not moving along your colon and you get very impacted and very uncomfortable um, and it's taking you days and days to be able to get your bowels open, we can do interventions with similar tubes like the ones on the right hand side here, like feeding tubes into your bowel that you can use to wash out the colon and allow some more um, liquid into there, which can then keep, keep a bit more motility. But we could also consider shortening the colon so that there's less m a room for things to have to move along. You can also think about having a, a colostomy bag, which I'm aware some people in the group may have already for emergency reasons. They can also be used very effectively for managing motility problems. Um, so that's perhaps something to talk about another day. Colostomies, I know, can be for some people a really, really scary prospect. But if it's that or never having your bowels open, you know, most people would feel much, much better with a colostomy bag um, than in that situation. 
I know that often those are seen as a terminal thing, like the last thing you ever want, but I work heavily with the stoma population and there are some so people who have colostomies and ileostomies, which come from the small bowel. And um, you know, their stories and their advocacy for the community is really, really amazing. And we find that actually people have a much, much better quality of life um, if they've had really bad conditions when they have a stoma than when they didn't have one. Um, we could also obviously consider tube feeding. So when patients have had enough of having to drink liquid supplement drinks all the time, or that's not working very effectively anymore, we can pop a tube uh, that goes into your tummy and then we would extend it through to your small bowel, that's sometimes called peg J. So we feed it into your jejunum, which is the first part of your small bowel. Um, and that gets around the issue of the um, small bowel, um, sorry, the, stop, my phone's ringing, and that gets around the issue of the gastric emptying problems. So we can do that for some of our patients and it's really effective. If you have a tube, it doesn't mean you can never eat. It means that the pressure is off your eating. So you might choose to have some breakfast because you really enjoy it, a little bit of food here and there, rather than this huge pressure to constantly have to be eating little and often and knowing you're going to have symptoms. If tube feeding works effectively for you, it can be a really great way of managing symptoms and also give you back a bit more quality of life. Certainly the patients that I work with who go on to make the decision to have a tube feed do it in a very informed way at the right time for them and because they know that they've tried everything else and actually they just want to take the pressure off themselves. The top picture of that feeding tube is one that you would be placed initially so that's what it would look like in the first instance. The one below that is what we call a button and that top tube can be replaced with a button when you've had a tube for a short amount of time so you can see that it's really quite discreet um, it shouldn't take over your life in the way that you might think it, it will um, and it should allow you to have a bit more uh, freedom and obviously people swim with them and don't have a problem and you can pop a plaster over it if you don't want people to see but really it doesn't have to be life limiting in the way that perhaps you might think it would be our last resort in terms of nutrition is intravenous feeding um, and this would be through a line that goes into your veins and we would feed you nutrition that's specially prepared for your veins so it bypasses the gastrointestinal tract altogether and we make sure that you get all of the nutrition that you need into your veins. Initially it might be fed into a line in your arm and then later into your, a line in your chest or permanent line in your chest like the one you can see in this picture. We often call this kind of parenteral nutrition, we call it a parenteral, not using the enteral tract, which refers to the GI tract. We often call it total parenteral nutrition. And in a lot of ways, that's quite misleading because patients, particularly patients with EDS, can obviously still eat if they want to. It doesn't have to be their only source of nutrition. It's very helpful sometimes to be able to top up your nutrition two or three days a week so that you've got some good nutrition going in and you're not getting nutritionally deficient in anything and that you're feeling well, we can top up your fluids, but then the food that you eat is mainly for joy and for pleasure rather than it being for nutrition and you having to force yourself to eat when it's uncomfortable and, str and you're struggling with that all the time. So that's intravenous feeding, which again, I'd like you all to remember is the last resort for all of these kinds of things. And the reason for that is because there's quite a high risk of infection. It's quite invasive in your body and it's not a natural or physiological way to get nutrients into your body. Where it's used appropriately, where it's used and it's necessary, it's a very, very effective treatment. And it can obviously take the pressure off if you are struggling to eat enough or your GI tract is failing. But it would be a last resort and patients would make that decision alongside a broad MDT, so multidisciplinary team who would help them to come to that decision that actually that was the best course of treatment for them. I'm going to mention about self-advocacy. I think it's so important for you. Um, EDS is a poorly recognised, poorly understood condition, meaning that self-advocacy, standing up for yourself, telling your doctor what you need, saying this is my condition, this is the help that I need, is required. And I, you know, I mean, unfortunately, when I say it in that, uh, in that sentence, I'm going to put a link to this underneath the um, presentation on the Facebook group. But this is uh, from the Royal College of GPs and this is freely available on their website. So if you go to your GP and they say, I don't know anything about it, please direct them to this information. Um, you can send a link to the practice so they can try and read up a little bit more about it. But on this website, um, it's, there's a really handy toolkit. There's the video, which is really, really helpful. And you can see that there's all different things here, including key points, when to suspect EDS, when do we think it's going to be, diagnosing it in primary care, um, thinking about who to refer people to, medications, treatments, all the things that your GP could be trying um, 
before you have to go down any other kind of route and I you know I really do understand that actually understanding is really really poor um, amongst all healthcare professionals it's certainly not just GPs but I know they're sort of at the front line of these kinds of things um yes I was just going to say also um you know there's not necessarily good understanding amongst anybody in terms of EDS so we do have to be aware of that so these are, this is some of the feedback that you gave me. Um, sometimes I put this at the beginning of the presentation, but I, I felt that it sat quite nicely here as we lead into questions and can reflect on the things that we've talked about so far. Um, one of the mistakes I made when putting this survey together was obviously not having a no on this question because the vast majority of you said that no, you've never had any dietary help for your condition. Um, I noticed from the feedback that lots of you had seen a dietitian, which wasn't very helpful for you at that time. Um, one of the things to remember that dietitians can do if they do understand about EDS is write to your GP and that's the thing I was going to say on the last slide is commonly when I'm working with patients the, the work that I do is writing to the GP or, and saying this is what this person needs, this is the condition they have and this is what this person needs and when that guidance comes from another healthcare professional usually GPs are much more open to prescribing things and trying things or referring on if necessary um, especially where there's been resistance before. How useful was the dietary advice you received? Unfortunately, most of you who did receive some dietary advice did not find it very useful. And I do understand that. And you know, you're another patient group, and I speak to lots of patient groups from disadvantaged kind of patient groups in my career. Most of you are not getting very useful dietary advice, which is fully understandable considering how poorly understood the condition is, and also all of the nutritional information that's flying around in the world about what we should and shouldn't be doing. Um, and I know that that you know nutritional information is, is shared rifely amongst support groups and everyone else because everyone wants to support people and actually very often the nutrition advice within support groups is very helpful sometimes more helpful than from healthcare professionals but ultimately everyone's so different uh, and it's not necessarily the right thing for everybody despite this and i'm not sure this work's ever been done before to be honest when i was looking for evidence around this topic and um, there's not very much out there but more than 80 percent of you find or, or find that your condition significantly affects your diet and food choices so it has this huge impact on your day-to-day -day decision making around food and your experience of eating food and your quality of life with food um, and yet is a very under-researched and un poorly understood area of practice certainly for dietitians but in, in nutrition generally. I'm going to move on to answer some of the questions that came up on the presentation um, this will probably take another 10 minutes or so and then I will jump out and, and so that we can see the questions that have come up on the Facebook group. Hopefully there's been some of you chatting and asking some questions. I can't currently see them but I will um, have a look at them shortly. So the first one on here, maybe you can't read it because it might be quite small, is what are the different types of gut motility? This person's aware of gastroparesis but are there names for dysmotility elsewhere in the digestive system? We would call all of the different types of motility, GI motility problems or dysmotility. Um, we might say colonic dysmotility if we were referring specifically to the colon, but certainly um, all the different types of gut motility, all, all the gut motility throughout your gut can be affected by EDS, um, and it commonly is. Um, and we would just refer to the different parts of the GI tract as, being, as having dysmotility. So small bowel dysmotility is just as common as gastric dysmotility. What tests should we re request from our GP to get baseline nutrient, nutrition levels that could be affecting us negatively? So the best ones to ask for are iron studies, vitamin B12, and then I usually ask for zinc and selenium when I'm writing to GPs. That gives us a pretty clear picture of what's likely to be being absorbed and not absorbed in the GI tract. So again, that's iron studies, vitamin B12, zinc and selenium. Um, someone is saying, I find fasting and homemade kefir has significantly helped my digestive issues. I don't take any medication now. Do you have more information about this? What are your thoughts of, on keto and reduced inflammation? So, um, yeah, I mean, your, the bacteria that live in your colon are significantly affected by the food that you eat and also by having probiotic drinks and things like that. So kefir can be really helpful for some people. It's certainly not the answer for everybody. Um, and I think we sometimes get into sort of a bit of a trap of thinking, well, this works for me, so this is going to work for everybody. And sometimes people in this sort of situation are saying, we're well, just not trying hard enough, try more, have more of this, try more of this. And actually for some people, it's just never going to work. It's brilliant that it's worked for you. And that's so great that you're off medication. Um, and maybe the 
pr primary issue with your gut function at that time was to do with fermentation and, and the balance of bacteria that's living in there. Um, most commonly it's to do with contractions of the bowel, which certainly won't be supported very much by these kinds of interventions, but it can be very helpful for some people. Um, I know some, there were some questions that came through about the low FODMAP diet. I think that will come up. Um, keto, there's no evidence that a ketogenic diet will, uh, which is a, a carbohydrate free diet, will reduce inflammation. So I certainly wouldn't recommend that. From a fatigue management point of view, a ketogenic diet can cause significant problems with fatigue. It also generally starves your gut bacteria. So it's sort of a bit of a counterproductive um, thing to do. Um, so I certainly wouldn't recommend a keto diet for anyone with EDS. I have EDS, poor absorption and a stoma since May morning bowel perforation. I'm constantly tired and food is coming out undigested. What do I do? You very much need to speak to a gastroenterologist. Um, obviously, you can see me first of all if you want to, and I can help you to get a referral. It's very, very important that you see a gastroenterologist um, and get some support with that. There is some great help with the stoma community um, and your stoma, the company who supply your stoma bags, We'll have lots of nutrition information. You should be able to access a stoma nurse through then who can give you some more advice. But um, stomas, you know, there's lots and lots of great dietary information out there. Most of it I've written, so I know it's pretty good quality. Um, you know, com a group again that I work with very commonly. So please do look up all of that stuff. Um, I also did a podcast series this year with a colleague of mine called Misha called Stories from the Inside, where we talked a lot about um, stomas and nutritional management of stomas and how we manage those. Um, and that's all available via my Instagram page if you want to have a look. Does a balanced vegetarian or vegan diet provide enough support nutritionally for those diagnosed with EDS? This depends very much on how well balanced your diet is and can be based on how bad your symptoms are. So um, we can't hide from the fact that certainly a vegan diet and almost always a vegetarian diet are much lower in nutritional adequacy. So you have to work much, much harder to meet your nutritional requirements on either a vegetarian or a vegan diet. Um, you also must accept that both of those diets are much higher in fiber. And for some of the uh, conditions and things that we talked about earlier in terms of um, diet and EDS, you may well struggle to, to tolerate that amount of fiber or those particular types of fiber in your diet. So for most people, it may be a struggle to be vegetarian or vegan with EDS. For some people, it makes you really well and the increased fibre and increased fruits and vegetables may well support the condition, but it very much depends on where you are in terms of stages and how it's affecting you. Diverticular disease is a condition that I also see very commonly in my clinics. Um, how can I help diverticular disease if fibre doesn't seem to help and the condition is too varied to find an eating pattern? Should I take supplements and if so, what? So in terms of diverticular disease and diverticulitis, that's little pockets of bowel that perforate out, so herniate out inter internally on the bowel wall. Um, and little bits of poo and food can collect in those and go rotten and that can then create inflammation and sepsis, we call it, so blood problem, blood poisoning basically. Um, it's a, it's a complex condition to manage. It depends on what stage of diverticular itis you're at and where it's affecting you and all these kinds of things. Um, the key is to keep the stool soft and easy to pass and constantly moving through your gut, which can be very difficult with EDS. So those two conditions in combination will always be a challenge. I'd recommend that you try and see a gastro dietitian, so someone within the NHS who's specialist in gastrointestinal conditions who should be able to help you, ideally a colorectal dietitian, uh, and obviously, um, as much as I don't want to keep plugging myself, you are welcome to come uh, and book in an appointment. It is something I, I work with commonly. Um, how can I lose weight with numerous health conditions which make me put on weight, but mean I keep on keep it on to e.g. underactive thyroid, polycystic ovarian syndrome, get very tired. It's very um, it's very difficult. Weight management is very tricky, um, especially when you have lots of um, overarching health conditions. Underactive thyroid and PCOS are, are difficult to manage. It's always difficult to manage your weight when you have those conditions. Um, what you probably need is to think about trying to create calorie deficits so you have not so much, so much to eat in a way that's sustainable for you. Um, and that's very different for everybody. And finding a way to eat that means that you've got good energy levels, that your bowel is functioning as well as possible, and you are still managing to lose weight is going to be tricky. There will absolutely be an NHS dietitian that can support you with that. You shouldn't be on your own trying to manage that. It's, um, it's, it will be complicated for you. Um, I challenge you to think about why you want to lose weight. So is it actually going to support your health to lose weight or is it for image purposes? 
um, we you know focus very often on our body image and, and what we want to look like and being thin and actually you know your health may be measured in other ways apart from your thinness and you might want to focus on exercising because it helps your mental health you might want to exercise on exercising uh, sorry focus on exercising because it supports your bowel motility rather than thinking quite so much about our weight as the the only metric of our health so if we eat well and eat, we eat lots of fruits and vegetables and lots of healthy food and we exercise and we look after our mental health whether we lose weight or not we will still be much much healthier than those who don't do those things so you know health is a holistic thing and your weight certainly isn't the only measure of health i have numerous issues but the embarrassment comes from the continual diarrhea blood loss recurring hemorrhoids i would love some tips on how to cope with this yeah really really tricky um, the key will be to increase your soluble fiber so the inside of the apple melon soft soft fibers that draw lots of water to the bowel keep the stool really really soft avoid scratchy types of fiber so nuts skins peels those sorts of things that can cause abrasive problems on the inside of the bowel wall um, but the soluble fiber can help to provide some level of bulk to the stool if i was your dietitian i'd probably also be prescribing some um some fiber supplements that could create a bit more structure to the poo and help things move along a bit more easily but still slide out at the other end in a way that's comfortable and not creating more hemorrhoids and more problems and um, is a tricky thing to manage um, but fiber manipulation and fiber supplementation should be able to get you there um, but i can't give any more advice on that but without properly assessing you this poor person has atrial fibrillation dizziness joint pain and when there's wind in my stomach um i.e verbal wind i have dismissed with every healthcare professional yet yeah. I also get episodes of pain discomfort. Um, I have atrial fibrillation when there's wind. Yeah, I suspect I do know what's happening here. I think what's happening is you're having a problem where your, your stomach's perhaps a little bit delayed in emptying. And then when it suddenly empties, you're getting a big, big dose of carbohydrates into your small bowel, which is then raising your blood sugars really quickly and then dropping them down really quickly. And we call this dumping syndrome please read about dumping syndrome and see if you think that fits in with your pattern because i suspect that's what's happening here sorry to call it dumping syndrome is just what it's called it's not very glamorous but that's the name of it and it refers to the dumping of nutrients from your stomach into your small bowel probiotics slowly start to relieve that's good happens every couple of weeks yeah dumping syndrome can be really really debilitating and it really drops your blood pressure very quickly which is what you're experiencing i think and can lead to huge fatigue um, and it doesn't surprise me that you have problems with joint pain around that time as well, because it's probably just feeding into all the other symptoms that you have. So I've got two more and then we'll have a look on what's going on on Facebook. So gastroparesis self-help when managing food allergies intolerance, um, receiving ONS, so oral so sit feeds on prescription, how to use them more creatively, I've got aims on prescription, struggle to meet my daily target. Um, dietitian says helps with recipes. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are some really good recipe books on the AIMS website. And um, I will, if you message me on Facebook, then I'll send you a link to those. Very happy to help you look for recipes on those. There's def there, those resources are definitely available. And I'm sorry that you weren't directed to them directly by your dietitian in the NHS. This person says, I have to spend three or four hours a day lying on my side in order to have bowel movements. It, I take an unbelievable amount of laxative. When is the time to take drastic action? That's a conversation for you and your team. That is a conversation for you and healthcare professionals to decide when it's time, when you've had enough, really. There are interventions that can be done to help support you. I think that we all in, in this sort of world have this idea that it's all or nothing. So it's either drastic action, or I'm never going to eat again, or surgery or nothing. There are often lots of things and lots of stages along that pathway, like we talked about earlier, that might be better for you. And, and you know, the, the key is to have the support and, and conversation with your healthcare professional team. And you should have a multidisciplinary team supporting you with that. In the self-advocacy department, I should absolutely have said that you, you should all try and find a specialist in your local area that you can ask to be re referred to. Uh, and sometimes that can take a little bit of ringing around and a little bit of um, discussion with other people in your local area about who might be amenable to helping you and supporting you so not all gastroenterologists and not all colorectal surgeons will have good knowledge and awareness of uh, these conditions but those who do will be very passionately um, there to support you and, and help you and that that can be all you need sometimes to really make a breakthrough with your medical team so you all have a right to say i want to be referred to somebody else with a specialist interest in this but it may be that you need to find the right person for you 
I hope that was useful. I'm going to close the presentation now and then we can see what's going on on the Facebook page.